Thank you, sir. Thank you, Naren. It's a real pleasure to, to be here. I was very honoured that you asked me. And, but now I know uh, who, to, who to blame. I'll, I'll talk to Helen <laughs> about that. So uh, this, is, this is where I work at Macquarie University Hospital, just to uh, make you envious. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone recognises this is Sydney, but I know you keep saying good morning to everyone. Uh, in Sydney, it's sunset right now. It's, it's Sunday night, so uh, that's where I am at the moment. So uh, I think we all know that syringomyelia is not really a diagnosis in itself. It's usually something that we see in association with other conditions. And I think of it in terms of craniosurbical junction disorders and spinal disorders. Um, and, but when it comes to idiopathic syringomyelia, that's really just what's left over after you look at all the other associated conditions. So it's a difficult thing to really talk about. And uh, I won't really confine myself just to idiopathic syringomyelia because particularly when it comes to syrinx shunts, it's not just idiopathic syringomyelia that I think uh, it provides an indication for doing shunts. So there are other conditions where there's been a failure of, uh, of Chiari treatment or if there are other conditions such as extensive arachnoiditis or spinal cord injury where we know what the underlying condition is, but it may not be uh, straightforward to know how to treat that. Dysraphism is another one. We know what the underlying associated condition is, but whether or not to detail the cord or just do a shunt is, is not a clear choice. And then there are cases like this where some people might call this Chiari malformation, but others might call it an idiopathic syrinx. But I would point to the clue here, which is this increase this high signal on the T2 in the central canal going up into the fourth ventricle. And we, we, we know now that that is an indication that there's likely to be a membrane across the foramen of Majondi. And this is actually a communicating type of syrinx where the CSF comes from the fourth ventricle down the central canal uh, into the syrinx cavity. And so we treat that by opening up the foramen of Majondi and putting a shunt to collapse the syrinx. So the point I'm making here is that the, the Classifying something as, a, as an idiopathic syrinx is really quite difficult. So these are more examples. Is this a problem of uh, the craniosurbical junction or is it, a, is it a cervical spine problem? Is this a problem here or again, cervical spine? It's, it's not clear often. And then you might look at this type of case, clearly not a Chiari malformation. Uh, some people might say that this is a syrinx related to the spinal canal stenosis. But I was fortunate to have an earlier scan from the same patient nearly 10 years prior, and she had the syrinx, but not that disc disease. So uh, I think that it was, is enough evidence that this is not related to that disc disease and cord compression. But there are, there are definitely cases where we never really can see the underlying cause, as in this young man and this young woman who present with symptomatic uh, syringomyelia, but without any clear associated cause. So what I'm going to go through today is, is our approach to investigating uh, cases where you might think it's idiopathic and then touch a bit on the treatment dilemmas and then talk about my approach to syringo subarachnoid shunt surgery. So if we, if we look at what's called idiopathic syringomyelia, there's not a lot written about this specifically. It's often just put at the end of a list of syrinx uh, uh, publications saying that some of them were were idiopathic, but in terms of publications specifically looking at uh, idiopathic syringomyelia, the, the case series are quite small. Over the last few years, there's been quite a few publications looking at um, syringomyelia in association with scoliosis, particularly from the orthopedic surgeons, comparing the outcomes from, of surgery with comparing Chiari-related syrinx and what is otherwise called idiopathic syrinx, but I think they kind of dichotomize the syrinx into those two, two categories. So there's not a lot of neurosurgical publications on this topic. I think we'd all recognize that it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And I think that that exclusion is becoming smaller and smaller because our ability to identify underlying causes is increasing. And in particular, our ability to identify obstructions of CSF flow or dynamics in the subarachnoid space is improving. And so that diagnosis of idiopathic syringomyelia is becoming a smaller and smaller group. So coming to the ways that we look at 
how to uh, identify uh, abnormalities in the subarachnoid space. Obviously, myelography and standard T1 and T2 MRI will show us the subarachnoid space, but they don't really show obstructions. Most of the obstructions that we're dealing with in the subarachnoid space are not uh, watertight. They don't have cell, they don't have membranes that have tight junctions. Even if there's an arachnoid membrane, it doesn't have a tight junction. So the water soluble contrast that's injected uh, these days in the subarachnoid space just goes through that. So it doesn't identify obstructions. And T1 and T2 scans don't show uh, dynamic obstructions. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, phase, cardiac gated phase contrast. This is very useful. We, we definitely use this. So we can see, for example, here where there might, might be an obstruction to CSF flow. But this imaging technique doesn't demonstrate the anatomy uh, as well as the, as the pathology. So what we've turned to to use a lot is cardiac gated uh, BFFE or Fiesta, depending on the, the maker of the, of the MRI, because it shows the dynamics and, and the structural pathology. This is not a Syrinx case, but I, I thought it's useful to demonstrate the exquisite detail here with an arachnoid cyst in a child. And I think we can all see that there is a, a cyst ventral to the cord, but understand the dynamics is much more clear with the dynamic uh, BFFE scan, showing that, that neuroenteric cyst and the dynamic impact that that has on the cord. We also use intraoperative ultrasound a lot. Um, it, is very good at showing the structure of the syrinx and also the membranes in the subarachnoid space and flow in the subarachnoid space. And that's very important, obviously not for preoperative diagnosis, but for intraoperative decision-making. So the aims of that combination of dynamic MR and intraoperative ultrasound, I think are really to, to improve our identification of the underlying cause of a syrinx and making better decisions about treatment and intraoperative management. And of course, my, one of my pet interests is, the, um, is trying to understand the pathophysiology of syringa myelia, and hopefully these techniques will improve our understanding of that. This is a case that might be called idiopathic, although I'm sure many people would recognize that there are clues here as to the pathology, but that's demonstrated much more clearly on the dynamic uh, MR showing that membrane at the inferior aspect of the syrinx. And the intraoperative ultrasound demonstrates that membrane, again, very clearly at the inferior pole of the syrinx. And at operation, that uh, arachnoid membrane uh, is, uh, clearly matches what was seen on the MRI and uh, clearly separating the, the CSF compartments, rostral and caudal. And that's the, that's the patient uh, after excision of that arachnoid membrane. There are other cases though where it's perhaps not quite so clear. On the pre, on the standard T2 scan done at an outside institution, there was a lot of concern about this being neoplastic. And indeed there was a little bit of contrast enhancement. But on our dynamic scan, it was very clear that this syrinx, this somewhat complex syrinx, is actually related to an arachnoid membrane dorsal to the cord in the subarachnoid space. And when we resected that, the syrinx resolved. There was clearly the underlying pathology. Syrinxes don't have to be large. This is a, a small syrinx outside the central canal and in the dorsal horn and very symptomatic for this patient with, uh, with neuropathic pain in, in the chest wall. And I think it would be very difficult just on the standard T2 scan to identify that the underlying cause is actually an arachnoid membrane just there. As I said, we use the uh, phase contrast a lot and we combine that with the with the dynamic BFFE so here we could see the the membrane sometimes it's necessary to play with the windows to to see it more clearly just going through a couple more examples just showing that the the ability of this technique to demonstrate the membrane in the subarachnoid space as the underlying cause of what might otherwise be called an idiopathic syrinx is really very exquisite that's that same patient after a section of that membrane showing that the syrinx resolves. It's not always straightforward though, and I, don't, I wouldn't try to put forward this technique as being perfect by any means. So here on the standard T2, I think there's, there's a clue that there's going to be a problem here because there's a change in the signal characteristic uh, 
related to the flow artifact. And on the, on the BFFE, we were able to see the membrane across here. But at operation, it wasn't just a single membrane. There was a mesh of arachnoid uh, inferior to that membrane across the whole surface of the, of the syrinx that uh, when we open the dura, there's the membrane. And then there's that mesh of arachnoid uh, bands between the dura and the cord that weren't actually demonstrated on the BFFE scan. A situation where this technique is extremely useful is identifying the difference between an arachnoid membrane or, or an arachnoid cyst. So we clearly see that membrane even on the standard T2, but whether that's a single membrane or an arachnoid cyst with some inferior membrane is not clear on that scan, but it's clearly very important in terms of decision making because if it's a cyst, we want to excise the whole cyst and not just the top membrane. So the dynamic scans show that these two cases are quite different. The one on the left has a single membrane at the inferior aspect of the syrinx. And the case on the right, which otherwise looks really very similar, is actually an arachnoid cyst. And I'm, I hope that shows clearly this is a membrane at the inferior pole of that arachnoid cyst, which clearly makes a big difference in terms of the operative approach. As I mentioned, the, the BFFE is not perfect. And when we first started using this te technique, there were a few traps we fell into. I wondered whether that was a membrane across there in this high cervical syrinx. But at operation, of course, uh, that turned out to be pica and there was no abnormality in the subarachnoid space. And so that's the kind of case where we were putting the shunt. Uh, with this case, uh, there's a suspicion of, a, of subarachnoid pathology here, dorsal to the cord. And indeed on the, on the uh, phase contrast, and in BFFE, there was suspicion of membrane uh, across here, dorsal to the cord. But at operation, the subarachnoid space was completely normal. There were no membranes obstructing CSF flow and the, and the subarachnoid space was completely uh, devoid of any, uh, any evident obstruction. So again, that's the kind of case where we put in a shunt and, uh, and they do very well. But there are cases where uh, we would have to say it's clearly uh, um, uh, what we'd call it, uh, idiopathic. The limit of this technique is reached when the cord expands and there is no subarachnoid space. And so it's, it's just not possible to tell on this scan whether there's any pathology in the subarachnoid space. So when we expose the cord, again, the, the intraoperative ultrasound is not perfect. You might uh, think that this demonstrates a membrane here, but uh, it really takes a fair bit of experience to tell that that was actually just a, a, a midline uh, arachnoid strand and not a membrane going across the whole dorsal subarachnoid space. And so the subarachnoid space in that case was um, really completely normal. And so again, that's one where we would use a shunt. I wanted to just mention the situation of multiple cavities. So this is a, this is the same patient. There's a, a cervical syrinx cavity and a thoracic syrinx cavity, uh, much larger. She was symptomatic. From, from this syrinx. The uh, BFFE doesn't show any uh, subarachnoid pathology. So we would call that an idiopathic syrinx, meaning we haven't been able to find the pathology. But what I wanted to point out here is that treating the thoracic syrinx, so what we did here was operate and put in a shunt, that's the shunt tube in the thoracic syrinx, and both syrinx cavities will resolve. And that's, that's generally what occurs for those cases where there are multiple cavities. So I wanted to just emphasize that the dynamic imaging is really, has really been crucial in our approach to uh, syringomyelia management. So particularly that cardiac gated balanced fast field echo technique, which really has improved our ability to detect the underlying pathology and reducing those cases that we would call idiopathic. And the intraoperative ultrasound, again, very useful for making uh, decisions, even just confirming they're at the right level when we do a laminectomy and the surface of the cord looks completely normal. But neither of those techniques is perfect and we still have uh, cases where the uh, underlying cause is not evident. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are cases where the operative approach or the treatment approach is not clear. So these are patients who present symptomatic either from failed Chiari surgery um, or uh, arachnoiditis, uh, spinal cord injury and so on. And the approach there is not is not clear. 
And there's many options, of course. We could redo the posterior fossa decompression, which is often our approach for uh, Chiari-related syrinx cases. We could put in a duroplasty or a shunt. There are many different types of distal destination for a syrinx shunt, um, but we've settled on syrinx to subarachnoid space. I know that many people do syrinx to peritoneal cavity or syrinx to pleural cavity, but my experience has been that they're more, more troublesome, and I don't think they add anything because the syrinx to subarachnoid space shunt is uh, very useful in reducing the syrinx size. I think the, the main advantage of a syrinx to subarachnoid shunt is it's a very simple, what could be viewed as really a very simple operation. Uh, there's no uh, need to take the shunt outside the dura, which makes the dural closure much easier. There's no problems with CSF getting into the pleural cavity uh, or blockage of distal shunts. The theoretical disadvantages relate really to the uh, theoretical issues. So if, for example, uh, the underlying pathophysiology of the syrinx cavity is this piston theory where uh, the tonsils uh, impact in the subarachnoid space and increase the subarachnoid space pressure and force fluid into the, through the cord into a syrinx cavity, then putting a shunt from the syrinx cavity into the subarachnoid space theoretically would actually make that worse. So uh, I think the fact that that doesn't happen is evidence against that theory. There might be concerns about infection or blockage, but I think uh, I'll show you that with a, a careful technique, those uh, concerns are very, are very limited. This is obviously not a new technique. Uh, it's, uh, there have been uh, published, large published series, particularly from uh, Japanese authors who use this as their preferred technique for large syrinx cavities in relation to Chiari malformation. And their approach has generally been through the dorsal root entry zone and uh, reporting good results. I think these days, most people would, would uh, aim to treat the Chiari malformation first before doing a, a syrinx shunt. And so by removing Chiari malformation as the, as the reason for doing a shunt means that shunt series sizes have become uh, quite small. So in the last uh, decade or so, there've been very few uh, syrinx uh, shunt series and uh, and here's a table comparing syrinx shunt versus just doing arachnolysis and, uh, and the follow-up. What I want to talk, just point out here is that if we look at the shunt series, the syringo subarachnoid shunt series, the recurrence rates are really quite high. There's one series with zero recurrence, but up to 50% recurrence in, in other reported series. There are even uh, veterinary series of syringo subarachnoid shunt reporting good results. So uh, with that background, I think it's still fair to say that the, the role of uh, and the efficacy of syrinx to subarachnoid shunts remains uncertain. Um, but I, I wanted to just go through our experience, hopefully to uh, demonstrate that they are, I think, safe and effective. So if we look at uh, the, the series that we published a couple of years ago, this was uh, out of 125 syringomyelia patients undergoing 100, over 150 operations. This was the spread of underlying pathologies. So the majority, of course, related to Chiari malformation, but the spread of other pathologies. So to put in a shunt, the, for me, the indication for surgery is that the, the patient has to have some sort of neurological deficit, deficit or, or be symptomatic from the, from the, the syrinx and either there being no evident underlying cause, and so what we would call idiopathic, or that the uh, direct treatment of the underlying cause has failed or would otherwise be considered too difficult or too risky. So if we look at those patients who uh, did undergo a syrinx to subarachnoid shunt in this series, there are 41 patients fairly equally distributed between males and females. And these are the pathologies. So in blue are the uh, pathologies for all syrinx operations, and in red, the uh, syrinx to subarachnoid shunt operations. And just pointing out that uh, our approach for Chiari-related syrinx is to treat the Chiari malformation. I've not had to put a shunt in a syrinx for any of the patients that I've uh, done the first operation on. So these uh, few patients related to Chiari malformation are where the operation is done elsewhere. 
I'll just go spend a bit of time going through the, uh, the technique. So the approach uh, obviously is at the, the vertebral level where the maximum syrinx size or is or at least where it comes closest to the uh, surface of the cord. If it's a very large and long syrinx, then I'll tend to go at the more caudal aspect of, of the syrinx. I, my preference is to do a midline myelotomy. I know that many people will use a dorsal root entry zone approach, um, but my preference is a, a midline myelotomy, particularly for the, the idiopathic uh, syrinx cases where it does tend to be uh, a very midline syrinx like this one. I found that I'm, I'm very comfortable approaching a syrinx if that the distance from the dorsal surface of the cord to the syrinx cavity is two millimeters or less. Of course, it's possible if it's more than that, but I just find that the uh, disruption of the dorsal columns probably becomes a bit greater once you get past two millimeters. I try to use as small a shunt as possible. Um, my preference is the Spetzler lumbar peritoneal shunt tube and just cutting the tip off it. The outside diameter of that shunt is 1.1 millimeters, but uh, we tend to use the James, uh, that's the Medtronic shunt, which is more readily available. It has an outside diameter of 1.3 millimeters. It doesn't actually matter which direction you put the, the shunt catheter in, uh, whether it's coming in from rostral into the syrinx, syrinx cavity or, or heading uh, cordally. And you might think that if you had the shunt catheter directed rostrally that the, the pulse wave in the CSF might somehow force fluid into it. But the reality is that the wavelength of the pulse in the subarachnoid space is longer than a meter. So it's actually a single pulse going through the whole subarachnoid space and not a, and not a, a small wave pushing fluid along. The really critical point is that the distal part of the shunt must get into normal subarachnoid space. And I'll uh, show an example of where that didn't happen. Uh, so for example, it's very important that the catheter does not end up in the subdural space. It has to get into normal subarachnoid space and there must not be uh, caudal obstructions uh, to, the, to the subarachnoid space beyond the shunt. I'd like to get uh, holes in the shunt catheter both inside and outside the cord and I secure the shunt catheter with 8 nylon. I have previously used 9 nylon but I've had a couple of shunts dislodge uh, with that and so I've turned to using just 8 nylon. I usually don't do duroplasty unless there's very extensive arachnoiditis and that's required to establish a subarachnoid space. If the, uh, if the uh, myelotomy is made caudal to a complete spinal cord injury, it obviously doesn't matter where you make the, the cord opening. So this is a patient with a complete spinal cord injury, but suffering because the syrinx cavity is extending rostrally. And in those cases, making a, an opening into the caudal cord, non-functioning cord is, is really very straightforward. So here I'm just going to show my general approach to uh, a, a idiot, idiot, idiopathic uh, syrinx shunt. So I've made a, a partial opening through the dura and then I'm completing the dural opening with a blunt hook so that I can keep the arachnoid intact. And then I hitch up the dural edges uh, with, um, with sutures and I tie those. And then the arachnoid is open separately. And this is, a, this is so that I can be absolutely certain that I maintain a subarachnoid space and don't create a subdural space. So I'm using Liggy clips there to clip the arachnoid to the dural edges. And then I'm making sure that the uh, dorsal subarachnoid space communicates with the ventral subarachnoid space. And then here I'm identifying the, the midline, which is I'm gonna make a midline myelotomy and I'm identifying the midline by, first of all, just a rough guide is, the, is equidistant between the dorsal uh, root origins. But I find the most accurate way is to identify the penetration of the vessels into the cord. So there's one vessel penetrating, there's another vessel, and there's another vessel. And so if you draw a line uh, from between all those penetrating vessels, that is the midline. And then obviously you need enough distance between uh, penetrating vessels in order to make a myelotomy to insert a shunt catheter. Uh, sorry, I'll just, I've, I'll go back to there. So 
So to make the midline myelotomy in this case, I had to mobilize that uh, midline dorsal vein. So I want to put the, the shunt catheter in this segment of the cord. And this vein has no branches coming to it in the section. So I'm just using a, a sharp ophthalmic knife to divide the arachnoid over that vein and mobilize it. And then this incision in the pier is with that same uh, ophthalmic knife. This is the Roton round knife, which I find uh, really the best instrument to identify that midline raffe, because you can actually, if you use the flat side of the round knife, you can feel that, that fibrous septum that's in the midline uh, separating the dorsal columns. And then once that plane has been developed using the Roton round knife, I just get the, the bayonet microforceps, the finest ones we can get, and just, just gradually separating the dorsal columns and then uh, alternating between the, uh, between the microforceps and the Roton round knife to get into the syrinx cavity. And that's entering the syrinx cavity there. And I'll just go through. So this is now putting in the shunt catheter and I'm deliberately wriggling it. This is not a tremor. This is deliberately wriggling the catheter back and forward to just gently get it through that opening between the dorsal columns. And then once into the syrinx cavity, changing that direction of the catheter and sliding it into the, into the syrinx cavity. It's pretty clear when you feel that, that you're not hit, hitting up against the cord tissue. You can see, see here that I've left holes inside and outside the cord. And then that, uh, that catheter is put into the subarachnoid space, making sure that it really is underneath that arachnoid that I've tacked up to the dural edges. And then I secure that, um, that catheter to the, if there's arachnoiditis, to arachnoid. If not, then to the, to the surrounding dura. And the, the goal here is really just to stop the shunt catheter from sliding in a rostral caudal direction. And then the dural closure, I use 5 uh, hemocele proline, and that's the proline with the a smaller caliber needle. And uh, here, what I do is, is go from each end. So I'm bringing one, one suture from the rostral end, another suture from the caudal end, taking off those uh, clips as I go. And the, the purpose of doing it this way is that I end up in the, in the middle of that durotomy with two uh, proline sutures that I can then hand tie. I Personally, I find it very difficult to get a watertight closure using a, an instru instrument tie for nylon uh, either at one end or at both ends. So I've come to use this technique so that I get a, an opportunity to do a, um, a hand tie and I find that gives me the best watertight closure. So just a few uh, cases. This is a complex Chiari case treated with a shunt. That uh, dysraphism case that I showed earlier responds very well. Post-traumatic cases do well, but it's really important to get the shunt into normal subarachnoid space. And this is an example where that didn't happen. So uh, with the original surgery done elsewhere, they had put in a catheter from the syrinx, it was in the syrinx cavity, but what they obviously thought was subarachnoid space, but clearly on the axial scans, it's, this is the arachnoid and this is a, a false subdural space with the catheter in it. So the catheter is going from the syrinx to the subdural space and creating a high pressure subdural collection, which I've opened here. This is that false arachnoid that's been opened. Uh, and then uh, I'm into that false cavity, which is a subdural space. And then deep to that is the real arachnoid, which is opened here. And so all I had to do is to get the catheter from that subdural space into the right subarachnoid space. And then the syrinx collapses. For idiopathic syrinx, as I've shown that, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, and then uh, that's that case where there are the two cavities that got better. So in terms of the series that we published a couple of years ago, there's a three year follow up. The only, there are two patients that have an increase in pain and that does sometimes happen when a syrinx collapses. They seem to get uh, more function in the cord and that manifests as, as pain. And the only, one, the only syrinx cavities that don't collapse are the post-traumatic ones where the, where the surface of the cord is tethered to the surrounding dura. We do SF12 outcome measures for all the patients just to make sure that there's no major uh, physical or psychological uh, abnormalities that happen after surgery. And there were some complications, uh, a couple of CSF leaks that didn't require any surgery. One, one pseudomeningocele requiring surgery out of those 41 cases. 
We sometimes see uh, temporary lower limb sensory change related to the dorsal column manipulation, but that's, as I say, only temporary. There were two patients in that series who had increased pain, and there were three patients who had uh, re recurrences. And this case was a very instructive one for me. This is a man who had a spontaneous uh, subarach spinal subarachnoid hemorrhage. He's got a type of uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. So it's clearly a, some sort of connective tissue disorder. And I first saw him with myelopathy with cord edema. And I, I proposed doing de uh, tethering of that arachnoid scarring, but he refused and came back uh, a year later with now a, a syrinx cavity, cavity that had developed. And I interpreted this dynamic scan as demonstrating uh, tethering particularly here. So at the first operation, what I did was detether that, put a syrinx catheter in. But unfortunately, what I failed to recognize was that there was further tethering more inferiorly. And so now I've created an opening into the syrinx cavity, rostral to that persistent arachnoid uh, obstruction. And that actually led to an increase in size of the syrinx cavity. And so I had to take him back to the operating room and, and divide that uh, arachnoid tethering and put in a shunt across the subarachnoid space to keep that open. And he's done very well, very well with that. Um, there were a couple of cases where the, I used nino suture to, uh, to tether the syrinx catheter. And there were two cases where the, that shunt came out. So this is that one with the Chiari malformation and an idiopathic one. So those two I had to reoperate on. And if we look at the timing to revision surgery, that's uh, up to a couple of years. And I've not had any uh, need to revise operations since I've turned to ATO nylon. So just to wrap up in conclusion, I think uh, our series would support the idea that serious subarachnoid shunts are safe and effective. Uh, the workup and the imaging is really, really crucial in picking these cases. And in those selected cases, it's, it's a very reasonable treatment. And hopefully by doing this, uh, it does give us a better insight into the underlying pathophysiology. So thanks very much, uh, Naren. I hope uh, that's covered what's been, uh, what you wanted. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Studley. It was an absolutely elegant uh, uh, lecture covering all the things that we will want to know. Uh, certainly the operation looked very easy in your hands. Um, I think as you mentioned, the patient selection is very important. Um, and just to uh, uh, go over the patient selection, could you just uh, just recap to us again, um, what are the, um, uh, what, what would be the red, red signs for you uh, to not, and uh, you know, how do you know the symptoms are really uh, true and not the patient's um, psychological because they have a syrinx. Thank you. Yeah, so it is um, often the case that patients present with spinal axial pain and then the imaging has demonstrated a syrinx cavity. And so they'll come saying, you know, the syrinx is the cause of my back pain. That For me, that's not an indication for treating the syrinx. So what I'm looking for is evidence that the syrinx cavity has uh, extended beyond the central canal. So if it's, a, if it's an enlarged central canal as the, as the origin of the syrinx, which is not always the case, but if it is, then that will generally not be symptomatic until such time as it's at some point ruptures through the ependymal lining and then usually into the dorsal horn. And so you remember that case I showed there's very small syrinx, mm -hmm. but it was, it was in the dorsal horn. So what I'm looking for is evidence on the imaging of matching cord injury with, with their symptoms. So they've got to be symptomatic. There's got to be um, a definite syrinx cavity. And for me to do a shunt, um, it has to come close enough to the surface for me to be comfortable. And as I said, for me, that's two millimetres. If it's not big enough to come that close to the surface, I'll uh, generally uh, not, do, not do surgery. Thank you very much. That's a question from Dr. Lovga. Uh, Dr. Lovga, do you want to uh, ask the question? I'll just unmute. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for such a nice presentation and it's very important information for us. You mentioned today. Uh, Dr. It was always. Dr. Yeah, Loka, do you do you want, sorry. Yeah. 
Can you hear you? Could you introduce where are you from, please? Thank you. Yes, I am from Ukraine, from west part of Ukraine, uh, Kursk city, and I'm uh, chief of small pediatric neurosurgical department. So uh, I want to say, tell you thank you again for this very nice presentation and for information you mentioned for us. I just uh, I want to ask you about um, serum peritoneal shunt. Uh, you haven't mentioned about uh, putting this kind of shunt. Do you think it's not reasonable to do this kind of surgery? Or there are some specific indications for this surgery. Usually, uh, usually, it's uh, it's not easy to put safe uh, for first and uh, to treat for first time for, with first surgery a large uh, syringe. And in that case, uh, neurosurgeons uh, are still thinking thinking about between two kinds of surgeries. Uh, first step, like you mentioned today, or um, is better to put a syringe peritoneal shunt. What do you think about syringe peritoneal shunt? Is it uh, reasonable to do this kind of surgeries uh, as a first step, as a second step in case you uh, didn't treat with uh, syringe uh, subarachnoid shunt, or there is no reason to do this kind of surgeries? You, uh, that's that's great. Dr. Dr. Yeah. Loka, we'll get to Dr. Professor Stoodley to answer. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think the first of all, for most cases, there's no need to take the shunt catheter beyond the, the dura. So I think as I've shown, a, a series to subarachnoid shunt, um, provided you can get the distal catheter into the normal subarachnoid space, we would expect the syrinx cavity to collapse. Um, I think the reason that syrinx to peritoneal catheters were used was out of theoretical concern that it might actually create worsening of the syrinx cavity, but that clearly doesn't happen. So first of all, for me, the, one of the problems with syrinx to peritoneal or pleural shunts is that those patients tend to be prone to developing low pressure symptoms. So if, they, if you can get over drainage of, of, of general CSF. The second thing I suppose is that I would consider a syrinx to pleural or peritoneal shunt in a patient with very wide, very extensive arachnoiditis. So for example, with TB arachnoiditis, where um, it's, it's a very difficult uh, thing to find a normal subarachnoid space. That's, they're the situations where I would use a syrinx to shunt outside uh, the dura. There's a question from Dr. Um, uh, Ab Ab Abdi Fatah. Dr. Fatah, do you want to go ahead, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. For, for in, 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 introduce yourself, please. So, thank you. My name is uh, Khalif Abdi Fatah from Nairobi, Kenya. I want to ask a question. Um, how long do you wait uh, until you say uh, this? Uh, the neurology has improved or the shunt has a positive impact. If you put a shunt and, and, you, and the imaging is not very promising and the symptoms are not resolving, how long would you wait uh, before you go back and, and, and make a decision of either revision or telling the patient that this is not the cause of, of how his symptoms? Thank yeah, you. so, uh, I mean, I think what I tell the patients is that the main goal is to prevent uh, worsening, right? and that if they've got symptoms related to cord damage, and so that particularly that dissection into the dorsal horn, that may not improve uh, and, and, and often doesn't improve, even when you see the syrinx cavity collapse. So, uh, you know, I, I do a post-operative scan usually at three months. And what I'm expecting to see at that scan is collapse of the syrinx cavity. And I interpret that as meaning that the person is less vulnerable to new spinal cord damage. And so, I'm really just aiming for technical success in that sense, and just warning the patient that the, having the patient understand that the goal is to prevent worsening. So if at the, to answer your question, if at the three month mark, they've got a collapsed syrinx, but ongoing symptoms, I will reassure them that they're protected from worsening uh, neurological injury. And for those patients, particularly for the neuropathic pain ones, they will get improvement often over the next one or two years. So it's a slow process, but uh, the main thing is to get that technical success of collapsing the syrinx cavity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Gobalakrishnan, uh, do you want to ask? Yes, hi, Narain. Hi, Narain, and uh, thanks, Professor Studley, for the talk. Um, I had a question. I'm a professor and um, of uh, pediatric neurosurgery from India. So I had a question for you. So you did mention very specifically that the tube should lie in the subarachnoid space and not the subdural space. Mm -hmm. So do you actually close the arachnoid 
and I didn't see that. But um, it, do you, do you believe when we should actually close the arachnoid? So that because otherwise the subdural and the subarachnoid space is still in communication. Um, absolutely. So what I maybe I didn't uh, really point it out in the operative video was that I by tacking the um, by tacking the um, I'll just go to that next video. So by tacking the the arachnoid up to the dural edges, as I'm okay. sewing up the dura, those stitches go through the arachnoid, so that the okay. the arachnoid and the dura get closed together at the same time. I don't close the arachnoid separately, um, but it is, if you think of it, you know, as a cross section circle, the arachnoid is is now up against the dura. Sure. Yeah. I have that answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Studley, I have a question, uh, another one. Uh, in, uh, in UK, uh, many consultants will uh, use uh, neuro monitoring while operating for these patients. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, we have neuro monitoring and, I, and I'm, uh, you know, I definitely use neuro monitoring, both sensory and motor uh, monitoring for cases where I, where I might change what I did based on a change in the monitoring. But for syrinx to subarachnoid shunts, uh, it's a pretty small myelotomy. And, um, you know, I just can't imagine that I would stop doing anything just because they say the SSCPs uh, went off because I, I'm not causing enough um, disruption of the dorsal columns to really be concerned about that. So, so my, I don't use monitoring. Um, and as I say, I've not really had a problem. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, I think using monitoring as much as possible is a, is a good idea. Thank you very much. Sure. Professor Goel, do you want to uh, share any observations on Professor Studley's syringo subarachnoid shunt and the idiopathic syringomyelia? Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> Narin, this is a difficult question for a difficult person. So let me answer this question whilst I'm going to give my lecture. Marcus knows my views. And Marcus, do you want to comment on my views on this subject, Marcus? You know it, my but views. I do know your views, and I was, that's why I was very careful uh, when I said treatment of Chiari. And I didn't say, I think I might, I might have slipped up once and said posterior possibly compression, but I said treatment of, if there's failure of syrinx control with Chiari treatment. And, and look, I, I don't think that's really um, an issue here. I, I think um, your recent publication was very impressive in terms of the images that you had in that with the syrinx uh, collapse, which I've been, I was very impressed with. So as you know, I re retain an open mind um, about how it is that your approach results in syrinx resolution. But I think that for many of the cases we're talking about here, where there's arachnoid pathology in the thoracic spine, um, that's, that's the pathology. It's not at the craniosalacal junction or at C12. And so, and that's the majority of the cases here in this, in this series is that type of case. And so whilst I would accept that your approach to management of Chiari malformation results in very good syrinx uh, resolution, that's terrific. But for the other cases we're talking about here, I think syrinx shunt and resection of the membranes is, um, is the appropriate first up treatment. That's thank great. you, Marcus. Th thank, you. thank you very much, um, uh, Professor uh, Sudley. This was fantastic start for this uh, lecture series. I really enjoyed it, I'm sure um, everyone else has. Um, there are a couple of questions for you, further questions in the chat box. If you would mm -hmm. be kind enough to answer, that would be great. Thank you very much.